Before we begin this evening, uh, let me have, uh, make one other announcement, please. And that is that you please remember Nicole Teague. She is Lori Word's cousin. Uh, keep her in your prayers. She is having her second surgery tomorrow for her stage three ovarian cancer. And we certainly want to remember Nicole. Let's go to our Father in prayer, please. Father in heaven, we bow before you this Lord's Day evening. We do so, Father, humbly realizing that you do answer our prayers, that you love us, and Father, that you are on our side. We ask in a very special way that you be with Nicole Teague. This is a very difficult time. Father, cancer is such an, an ugly word, but it can be defeated. And we know that the greatest power we can use is the power of prayer. Be with her that she will have a successful surgery. Be with her that she'll be able to overcome the cancer. Be with the doctors and those that are handling this case. Forgive us when we fail you, Father, is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This evening I want to spend a little bit of time, next 10 minutes or so, it looks like, 10, 15 minutes, uh, talking about the greater responsibility we have as as Christians, as uh, people that God has saved and given us a responsibility. Several times in Scripture you find where for whatever reason, in a certain juncture of their life, people who were walking with God uh, would just walk away. Uh, they would shun their responsibility. Uh, let's look at responsibility. Am, am I on? Okay. Good. It's good to know that because along with my throat going bad, I think my ears are clogged up. That means I won't be able to hear Vicky gripe at me a whole lot. There you go. Uh, Jonah <clears throat> ran away from his responsibility. We all know this story. It's I'm not going to spend much time on this. Uh, in fact, and this is an uh, outline of, of Jonah you've heard before, but in fact, in chapter 1, Jonah ran from God. In chapter 2, he ran to God. In chapter 3, he ran with God. And in chapter 4, he ran ahead of God. So as you look at all of these things, uh, we get to Jonah chapter 1, the first two verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Now Jonah didn't have any problem doing that. Matter of fact, you'll find when you read the book of, of Jonah, that uh, this, uh, he didn't want to go in the first place, and, and uh, we'll see that in just a second, <clears throat> but uh, for as, as preaching against him and, and saying, you're in sin, he didn't have a problem with that. His problem was, later on, that God would dare save someone that was so low down, to his, in his way of thinking, for their evil has come up before me. There isn't any doubt about this, that God said, I want, I want you to go to a very tough place, I want you to preach the word against these people. Wouldn't be a popular thing to do. It'd be a difficult thing to do. And I, I'm telling you right now, you're going into an evil situation. You see all that from verses 1 and 2. It's not going to be the, the greatest place for your first preaching job. I remember my first preaching job was in Higdon, Arkansas, a great metropolis. You look at the population back in 1976. Higdon, Arkansas, up on Grizz Ferry Lake, was 46 people. 46, okay? And we would have about, in the summertime, 150 to 200 people in services. In the wintertime, you know, 100 to 120 people. But uh, I remember the first place I went to, it was kind of frightening. And so here he goes, and God says, this is your responsibility. I'm tagging you, you're it. You get there and you do this. Now, notice there wasn't any negotiating going on. God didn't say, how do you feel about this? You know, we come to Almighty God, and it's unlike this somewhat. We come to God, and we know what God expects from us. We know from His Word what He intends for us to do. I mean, it's just laid out for us. It's right there. But as we look at this, notice. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How many people have you known that have arisen and tried to flee from, from God, you know, what's around him, knowing exactly what they're supposed to do. President, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. 
responsibility. God says, Jonah, this is your responsibility. I'm not giving it to anyone else. This is you. Yes, over 100,000 people in Nineveh, okay. I'm still, I'm choosing you to go and speak to them. I'm not going to accept any excuse. And remember, God causes a great fish to swallow Jonah, and the fish vomits him up on dry ground. And Jonah, of course, goes in and, and uh, fulfills what God would have him to do somewhat, but he gets upset because of the people. Well, there's another one. I want to get to it as quickly as possible without uh, planning on staying there for a while, but don't have time tonight. Moses made excuses instead of accepting responsibility. Now, this is one of the greatest men in history. Moses, five excuses he gives to God. We'll go over those real briefly here. But God told Moses in Exodus 3 and verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Should have excited him. Moses, you're it. I want you to go lead my people. You know the history. You were there. You saw them. Some 400 years in captivity. Now it's time to set them free. And Moses, you are the one. But Moses wants to make an excuse. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Have you, I mean, every one of us in here, have you ever made an excuse about not wanting to get involved in something? I know we all have. And Moses is saying, Who am I? And God says, You are the one I have chosen to do this. Now we can read this and we can be all shocked. Well, how could anybody tell God no? I told God no the first 23 years of my life, from accountable age, whatever that was, until I age 23, I kept telling God no. So this isn't anything that's new here. And Moses is a whole lot older than 23 when this is happening. But notice this, Moses' second excuse. When Moses said to, then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God, I, I don't want to go, and I don't know what to say once I get there. I just don't know. It's a great lack of faith. You know, you know a lot of times, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even going to go there, but, well, I will too. Uh, there have been times when, when I, don't, I don't want any amens about this. A lot of times I've stood before audiences throughout the years, and when I got through preaching, I felt like I needed to repent thought, what am I doing up there? I don't know what's a, you know, and about halfway through the sermon, and all preachers go through this. You may not know this. All preachers I know of go through this. Well, you feel like, and please use this, accept this for just the example it is, you feel like you're up here all alone and you're not getting through to the people. And instead of blaming the people, you blame yourself. And after a while you learn, just blame the people. No, not really. But, you know, you feel like, well, I'm just flailing away up here and I'm not making any sense at all. No amens intended. But, uh, you know, as you look at this, that's what he's saying. What am I going to say to them? I don't know what I'm going to do here. God, you need to choose somebody else. Can you not tell by my response, I'm not excited about this? I remember by a look I had one time, uh, my dad told me to do something and, and I had that kind of look like I didn't want to do it. And he said, I can tell you're not really excited about this. And then he looked at me and he followed that with an addendum. You will get excited about this. Do you hear me? And then you perk up and you get pseudo excited. If you understand what I mean. What is this? Third excuse. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. God, I just don't, I, I'm telling you right now, excuse number three. I'm just not sold on this. I'm not going to belabor that point. Number four. Fourth excuse, but Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. God, you understand sometimes I get tongue-tied. Sometimes I, I, I stutter over my words. Sometimes, Father, I, I just can't explain myself the way I want to. And God says, but you're still the one. All these excuses, number four, God said, I'm not accepting a single one of them. I want you to, to do that. Have you ever had a, uh, know that you have a talent to do something, to serve God, but you refuse to do that? You have the talent and you refuse to do it. I wonder how God feels about that. 
whether that talent is, is preaching or teaching or leading singing, whatever the talent might be, praying. And, uh, you know, I wonder how God feels about that. What excuse that he accepts. Notice this, fifth excuse, and here we go. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. I got to the end. He said, here we go. God, this is not working out for me. I am being very strong-willed about that. Anybody in here ever raise a strong-willed child? I have one, and I won't tell you who it was, but her name's Christy. And she's strong-willed. She'll admit that. With Karen Renee, I could say, Karen, I think it's time for you to be quiet, please, and sit down on the couch. Yes, sir. She goes, sits down on the couch. That's Karen. She's like her mama. Christy is like the other parent. Christy, I think it's time for you to be quiet and go sit down on the, on the couch. Why? Well, because if you like your head where it is, you will go sit down on the couch. I'm going to sit down, but I don't like it. I'm just going to sit. And she'd sit there, and I'm telling you, she was a strong-willed. I'm not a bad child, a strong-willed child. And, you know, the way you handle that is, you'd be just as stubborn as she is. But there you go. Fifth excuse. Watch this. Uh, that was the fifth. Watch what God says. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Notice this. Why? Why are you upset, God? Because excuse after excuse after excuse will never get the job done. But the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, is there, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He said, Moses, listen to me. You are going to go. It's a done deal. You will do what I say. It's a done deal. And Aaron's going to be there with you. And before you start begging off on Aaron and making excuses for him, just let me tell you this. I'm going to be with his mouth and with your mouth. Now what else do you have to say? And so there they go. So excuse after excuse, it didn't make it. Let me get to at least one other one here. Peter denied, the Lord, uh, denied and lied instead of accepting responsibility. I've always loved this part of Scripture. Because it is so human. Now Peter was sitting outside. This is after Jesus Christ. Remember he's arrested. Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. Uh, just kind of a lie, right? I don't know what you mean. This is my excuse. Responsibility. Stand strong for Almighty God. Not if it's going to get me in trouble. Hey, I'm witnessing what they're doing to my Lord. I don't want the same thing done to me. So here you go. Then the next thing, remember this? And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. I don't know him. Now, I know before we, we cast all these doubts and all the ridicule upon uh, the Apostle Peter, we all would kind of sympathize that he's in a very precarious situation, right? But notice this. This is what Jesus said. Uh, he's the one, uh, here, we have to keep in mind, he's the very one that said, Lord, even if all the rest fail you and all the rest go away, I'm going to stand strong. God, if even all the rest are irresponsible, I'm going to be responsible. I'm telling you right now, God, you can depend on me. Now, Jesus had preached, and, and uh, Reuben mentioned it today in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, where Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess before my Father. Whoever denies me before men, I'll deny before my Father. And the Apostle Peter certainly knew what that was all about. And so here we go. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for your accent betrays you. You have a southern accent. No, I'm just teasing. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Now, here's somebody else. And I'll get to the last one. I'm going to have time to do this. I'm, you're getting a 15-minute sermon, a 35-minute sermon in 15 minutes. So here you go. 
I know, don't anybody live. I like these better, Jack. There you go. Judas gave up and quit instead of taking the responsibility. You know, this is a, um, let's just read this. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. You took responsibility upon yourself to betray him. Now you want to deny the responsibility? Now notice, God would not accept the excuse. Notice, he had been with Jesus Christ all these three years, and now look what's happening. Now those that he betrayed Jesus with or by, they will not even accept an excuse. I've just kind of, I just changed my mind. Well, what's that to us? I've wondered, you know, I've wondered here. When it says he changed his mind, what if he would have gone back to the cross? You ever wondered about that? What if Judas had gone to the cross when, when Jesus Christ is hanging there? And instead of killing himself, would look up at the cross and would have said, My Lord, my Lord, just like the thief that you said today will be with you in paradise, will you forgive me? I've often wondered what would have happened but here he, he chose, you know, this happens, and then, then we notice the very next thing, what, what happens to Judas. Of course, we know that. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. And then, but the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought the, the, with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. So here you have four people. Four different instances from, from Jonah to, to Moses to Peter to Judas that had responsibility given to them by Almighty God. And they were on their way. And at least two of those instances, Peter and Judas, they've been around Jesus Christ for three years. Now, please don't take this as, as a negative because in, in all of it, the, the happening is negative. But in all of this, the message for us is quite clear. All of us are going to struggle with responsibility. All of us are going to struggle with making excuses. And all of us are going to struggle with that which God has, has given to us as our responsibility. And we'll try to find ways, as I said this morning, to, to justify ourselves out of that. I mentioned to the class that years ago, I guess it's been four, five, six, seven years, I don't know how many years ago it's been, but uh, I wrote a book called The Justification Principle, The Real American Pastime. And it's still lying back there in my office somewhere. I don't even know where it is now. But in that book, I go over excuse after excuse after excuse. And how that we have become a justifying nation, and what's sad, sometimes we become a justifying you know, congregation, not us in particular, but congregations do, uh, justifying individuals. But today, God has given us, in essence, the same responsibility. I want you, like Moses, to set the people free through the preaching of the Word. Like in Jonah's case, I don't want you to flee from the presence of God. I want you to stay in the presence of God and bring people to me. Like in Peter's case, I don't want you to deny me not one single time. Do not deny me. You stand strong and confess me before man. Then like in the case of Judas, notice that if you go astray, you can change your heart, change your mind, you can come back to me, and forgiveness can be yours. So you know the application to us is just there, responsibility. There may be someone here tonight that's never taken the responsibility to say yes to Almighty God, to become a child of His, to be buried with Christ in baptism, to be raised to walk in that newness of life. Maybe someone here tonight that needs prayer for strength, you need to repent, need to respond in some way. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.